This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony. Antonin Dvorak's Seventh Symphony was his big political statement. He was inspired to write it by the sight of thousands of his fellow Bohemians arriving at the railway station in Prague for a series of protests against the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which ruled Bohemia at the time. Dvorak's Slavonic dances had been a huge international success, but this was the first time he had filled a symphony with Czech folk elements. His friend and mentor Johannes Brahms was impressed, but Brahms was not very political, and when the time came for Dvorak to start on his next symphony in 1889, Brahms suggested that he should return to the sunshine and blue skies of his sixth symphony. Dvorak agreed, and the eighth is full of happy, major key, and very bohemian moments. But there's also a dark side to the eighth. Dvorak was finding that his new bohemian voice could be very versatile. Even the introduction is solemn, as if it were a carryover from the seventh. but the clouds part at the bird call of the solo flute. This melody will become the principal theme of the movement, and by the time it's run its chorus, we'll remember it as overwhelmingly pastoral and optimistic. But the somber music of the introduction keeps returning, and the development section is full of darker passages. This is something Dvorak did deliberately. When he first sketched the movement, it was very light and cheerful, but he soon realized the need for contrasts. He added the minor key introduction first, but then came the more difficult task of working the recurrences of it into the existing flow of the piece. In the end, the sun seems to shine more brightly after it has been darkened by passing shadows. Along the way, there are previews of material that would end up in Dvorak's Ninth Symphony. And some very dark moments, possibly a storm. leading to an upbeat coda. There are similar contrasts in the Adagio. Even at the opening, the mood is ambiguous, warm string passages with hints of a melancholy march.
About a third of the way through the movement, this reflective mood is interrupted by what sounds like a village band playing an arrangement from Wagner. When Wagner had come to Prague 25 years earlier to conduct his own music, Dvorak was a member of the viola section. Just as the movement seems to be ending, more Wagner. But it's just a momentary outburst before the peaceful conclusion. The third movement feels like a folk dance, or even a sad waltz. The traditional symphonic model established by Beethoven would have put the scherzo here, the musical joke, but this waltz is more like an intermezzo by Dvorak's friend Brahms. The central trio section sounds even more like folk music. The finale of Dvorak's eighth opens with a grand brass fanfare. The great Czech conductor Rafael Kublik once told his orchestra, Gentlemen, in Bohemia, the trumpets never call to battle. They always call to the dance. And that is what we get, a dignified theme that turns into a set of dancing variations. In keeping with the character of the rest of the symphony, the dance is interrupted here and there by darker moments. In his 1984 biography of Dvorak, Hans-Hubert Schinsler wrote that Dvorak himself said that he wanted to write a work different from the other symphonies, with individual thoughts worked out in a new way, though perhaps in the finale his bohemian temperament got the better of him." End quote. Schinsler goes on, when one walks in those forests surrounding Dvorak's country home on a sunny summer's day, with the birds singing and the leaves of the trees rustling in a gentle breeze, one can virtually hear the music." End quote. The 
Things begin to slow down, and the recapitulation flows effortlessly as the main themes return without any feeling of being pushed along. The way Dvorak closed out his major works has been compared to the guests reluctantly leaving a party, slowly making their way from the front door down the driveway to their cars before rushing out into the night. Dvorak's eighth was his first truly international symphony. He wrote it to celebrate his election to the Bohemian Academy of Science, Literature, and Arts, and took it to England with him to celebrate his honorary degree from Cambridge University. It was also the work that convinced Jeanette Thurber to hire him as the director of the new National Conservatory of Music in New York in 1892. In some ways, though, it's even more Bohemian than his seventh. When his regular publisher wanted to print it with his name in its German form, Anton, Dvorak refused. As a proud Bohemian, he took it to another firm, which was happy to have the new symphony by Antonin Dvorak. This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony.